tumble around all day. I try to stand up straight, but then I tumble down. Hi, and welcome to Talking with Giants. I'm your host, Scott Schilling. Thanks for joining us. This is going to be a fun show. There's no doubt about that. I like starting all these shows the exact same way, and that's with my pre-event prayer. So here goes. Lord, allow the words that we share here today to positively impact 100% of the lives in this audience one way, shape, or form. Only you know who you sent here to hear this message. Allow us to do the best we can to deliver that message via vehicle and of service to you. It's all we can ever control is a high intention and a low attachment. A high intention of imparting something great here today and a low attachment as to what that nugget might be for you. So. Uh, let me introduce my guest, Krish Dunham. He was born in India and finished his formal education with an MBA in the Institute of Management Technology. Equipped with that learning, migrated to the United States in 1986 with his bride, Anelia, wonderful lady. Uh, winning a sales contest in 1990, earned a ticket to a seminar conducted by the legendary motivator Zig Ziglar. This chance encounter would be the catalyst that shaped the next two decades as Chris joined Ziegler Corporation in 1991 as a telemarketer went on to eventually become their vice president of global operations. Today he's the global corporate adjunct to RZIM uh, and CEO of Sky Life Success, a co-founder of Krish Dunham Training, president of Mala Ministries. He's an author of The American Dream from an Indian Heart and From Abstracts to Absolutes, in addition to being a contributing author with a book Top Performance by Zig Ziglar. His latest book, Hard Hearted and uh, Hard Headed and Soft Hearted, was co authored with Rick Beluzzo, former president of Microsoft, also one of the founders of Witness at Work. Chris, welcome to Talking with Giants. Thanks a lot for having me, Scott. Always good to be with you. It's always so much fun. So, with such a varied career, where do we start all this? So, we got we to start with you coming to the United States. Tell everybody a little bit about that story. Well, growing up in India, I just uh, always wanted to live in America and come here and uh, enjoy the American dream. So everything that was ever posted on my walls in India were pictures of America, pictures of American landmarks. So I set my sights on this country when I was about eight years old and married a girl who brought me over here. So 1986, I landed here, nine bucks in my pocket. And now I love the story of what you did with the nine bucks, though. <laughs> sure, everybody, share that with everybody. Well, they gave me 20 in the New Delhi airport, so I spent 11 in Frankfurt because they told me that America was the land of the free. <laughs> I got here, I quickly realized that nothing was free, and of course, they also told me the land of cowboys show up here and all the cowboys wearing spandex and helmets, so slight disappointment. <laughs> but other than that, uh, uh, God has been kind. When we came and uh, got to the end of our financial rope, we tied a knot and hung on, and uh, that's how we began our life. Anila lost her job when she came back to India to marry me. and. Uh, People always ask me what motivates me, and I tell people hot water. When <laughs> yeah. I wake up in the morning, we have hot water, we have electricity. Now, jokingly, we tell people we had running water. If you needed it, you ran and got it. But that's not reasonably far from the truth. So life was tough, but uh, as Mr. Ziegler himself would say, if you're tough on yourself, life becomes easy. And um, I won't trade the last 30 years living in this country with any other experience I've ever had. That's awesome. I wish everybody had the attitude that you have towards it. I really do. Uh, uh, during our time with Get Motivated, hearing you speak there, um, you were my favorite speaker out of all the people there uh, because of your messaging and all that. What was it like spending all the years you did with Zig? Huh. A question I'm often asked, and probably more than any other person, and that is the fact of his consistency. Uh, with all humility, I must admit that he allowed me to carry his briefcase when nobody knew who I was but I had the rare privilege of taking him to the bathroom when Alzheimer's set in, and he didn't know who he was. So I truly had the privilege of serving him for all those years and got to experience consistency in a way that I can never describe it. I always tell people if the dictionary ever went pictorial, the word consistency should have the picture of Mr. Ziegler, otherwise don't buy the book. The most consistent man I've ever known. So. That's wonderful. I know you're one of the only two uh, executive coaches that was personally trained by Zig. That's got to be a tremendous honor. Yeah, uh, Brian Flanagan, a mutual colleague, being the other. And the reason that probably holds some amount of importance is both of us uh, truly were 
given designations by him, Brian, of course, to do the sales component, which is near and dear to your heart. Mm -hmm. And I took on the motivational mantle, which is ironic because I come from a country that historically prides itself on its negativity. So <laughs> for an Indian dude to be a motivational speaker, comedian, or athlete is itself an anomaly. So two out of three ain't bad, I guess. But uh, I don't know why. I don't know why he chose me or why he anointed me. But I remember the one thing that uh, we were in an airport, and some celebrity was walking through the airport. And they were both recognized each other. And for a brief moment, they started talking about how great each of them was. And then suddenly he paused and he says, before we exchange halos, I want you to say hello to the future. This is my boy. And he always had that way of including you to make you feel like a million bucks. So maybe that's why, uh, you know, I remember him one time saying, and I think it's in my, uh, he wrote it in the foreword of the book. He said, there was never a job I gave him that was so big that he said, I can't do it. I'll fail. Or never a job so small, he says, I'm too overqualified. He did everything with consistency. And I think that was our mutual attraction. I just wanted to be around him, so I was willing to do anything to be around him. That's, a, that's uh, inspiring in itself. Now, I know he uh, brought you to Christ. Mm -hmm. w what was that experience <laughs> like? Well, I married a Christian girl, and then uh, we were unequally yoked, to use a biblical term, I guess. But the audience needs to know that I'm not a theologian. I haven't been to seminary. I've yet to go to cemetery. But somewhere between womb and tomb, God's place to call. So I started attending churches and all that, just searching. And my bride said, hey, I want to raise our boy in the faith. Do you mind? It didn't matter to me. She said, well, I want to have him baptized. I said, what's that? She said, well, it's a ceremony at church, and we invite people. Well, Mr. Z was the only Christian I knew. So I said, can I invite him? And my reason was pure ego, because I knew they'd videotape it, and on boring parties, at least I'd have a celebrity <laughs> at my nice. son's baptism. So that was... But when I went and asked him the question, Mr. Ziegler, would you come to my son's baptism? He gave me the statement no pastor had ever given in any invitation anywhere in all the churches I'd ever attended. He says, why do you want to send your son to some place you're not sure you're going? And on July 23rd, July 28th, 1993, when I held my boy for the first time, I remembered Mr. Ziegler's words. And I said to myself, if this is the feeling and it can be perpetuated in eternity, I, I want that. So I turned to that mother-in-law of mine who had prayed for seven years that I would come to the foot of the cross. And uh, so I had the rare privilege of being baptized with my son, and Mr. Ziegler was in attendance. That's wonderful. <laughs> so fun. <laughs> so cool. And obviously has made a huge impact on your life. You spend a significant part of the year with your yes. international yeah. ministry. Yeah, Mala Ministries um, is... Um, a ministry I started in 2008 to serve uh, folks in India. We built a couple of churches. We actually set up a couple of scholarships, one in Mr. Ziegler's name. So people he will never meet will get advanced theological education in his name in a remote part of India. So all of that came as a genesis of that journey I took with him. But nine months of the year I work for the corporations like you do, and uh, we do seminars together. And uh, three months of the year I go around the world doing evangelism. The beauty of our ministry is our ministry has no salaries or any, no operational structure. When we have enough money, we buy a ticket and go. Uh, and the reason that's important is the ministry is completely funded by corporations whose bottom line I impact. That's, that's uh, amazing. Now, I know um, you're very close with Victor Abraham. Mm -hmm. You've started Sky Life, uh, Success, yeah. uh, a motivational arm. Mm -hmm. What's the design there? Uh, Skylight Success was an amalgamation of principles. We, rather than try to create a menu-driven option of saying, here's what we can do and stop us when you see something you like, we said we want to create a fusion of principles. So we brought people from entertainment background, finance background, hospitality, economics, consulting, business, and created a faculty of advisors that people can go to skylifesuccess.com, for example, and see what their problems are. We specialize in culture transformation. That be, that's our main Bellywick and hard-headed, soft-hearted was the primary book that was our gateway through that. But the beauty of that is it's not a menu-driven. We find out what a client wants and then match the faculty that would do that. I try not to be everything to everyone. I know my limitations. So that was the that was the genesis behind that. And you've you've done such an excellent job with that. It, um, Victor is an interesting <laughs> person. Can you share a little bit about another <laughs> great friend and and what he's accomplished? Well, uh, you know, when you, when you started with prayer and you talked about impact and you talked about attachment and all of that, I've never met a man more successful in my life with such a low level of attachment. Uh, but the model that 
I think works with him and me in terms of the relationship that's been about 15 years and counting now is a apostolic model. In the sense, if you look at the book of Acts, we're told to always have a Paul to look up to. And uh, Mr. Ziegler and whoever those people are, they become the Paul in our lives. We're always given edict to take it and leave it with Timothy. So whoever the Timothy is in our lives becomes our audience, becomes our students. But the one key ingredient that seems to be missing in most people's journey is the Barnabas. And uh, that's when I realized that Victor was my real life Barnabas. God had put a man in my life who, before he leaves on a trip, will call me and say that, remember, I'm supposed to take care of my preachers and teachers, and God has given me that ability. There is no want you should have that makes you demotivated because you're supposed to be positive. Anything you need, always reach out to me. And I've never had anybody talk to me that way with no request or no desire to have anything in return. He's just a giver. Well, and you guys have come to, to come together to create Witness at Work. And uh, <laughs> I was blessed to be at the last event. It, powerful. Sure. Um, in the last 20 plus years of traveling around this nation and around the world, I met a lot of Christian people. Uh, we all know companies can go to heaven. The individuals who build them will. So there's no such thing as a Christian company per se, but there's companies that are inundated and infused with Christian principles. But all of these people, I realized, had something in common. They had a story, but they didn't have a platform because they were not professional communicators. So they would invite me to speak in their company when they had a better story, when their principles, if articulated, would be a better message than someone like me who can slickly package a PowerPoint. So I said, let me create Witness at Work as a platform where I become the MC. And wherever we do this, my speaker friends are just the MC and the host. But individual businesses who run upwards of four or five million is the the number we look for, four or five million dollar companies, uh, because they're truly successful. And then we give them an opportunity for about 30 minutes to share their story as to how they witness at work. And then it becomes a practical demonstration of laity equipping laity. And uh, I was on the uh, website yesterday, mm -hmm. just wonderful materials being made available to those who need it sure. and those who want it. Yeah, so there are two tracks always. John Stott, the great, the man uh, who wrote The Cross of Christ, uh, said that apologetics and evangelism are two sides of the same coin. So one of the things in my travels I found out is some people are logical about their faith and can articulate and defend it, and some people are emotional about it. But I wanted to be able to provide them that gateway. So if you go to Witness at Work, one of the things you'll see is you'll see that opportunity in the resources to get seminary-level education from real life theologians who have actually dedicated their life and they've devoted and given that information to us so it's just at a click and then we'll have the apologetics information from Ravi Zacharias ministries so individuals can choose whether in their own witness at their own workplace they want to be logical in the defense of the faith or emotional in the invitation of it and whichever angle they take they're operating on the same you, know. you have uh, you have probably impacted me more far more than you know uh, <coughs> with just watching you. And isn't that, I, I had lunch with a, with a guy who happened to go to the University of Iowa, go Hawks, uh, and the whole reason that we had lunch is because we went to the same school together at the same time. We had never met. Mm -hmm. And we ended up discussing Christ mm -hmm. at lunch. And I said, the only thing Jesus has ever asked is follow me. Mm -hmm. He's never said, follow me, convert people. Mm -hmm. He's never said, be me. He's just said, live what I live. And that's what I see in you. Mm. I see him live in you. Well, that's, that's humbling. Um, you know, I've spent a better part of the last 15 years traipsing the globe trying to share the good news. Um, you know me in my corporate stance. I don't back down. But there's also a side of me that says there's no re reason to be, you know, rude, crude, mean, nasty. Um, Adrian Rogers said, let the Jesus in you find the Jesus in them. John 3.16 still works. God so loved the world. So I always tell people, if you want the Christ in you to be found by the Christ in others, ask yourself whether your ministry is Judea. Not everybody is called to the ends of the world. I am, so I go to the ends of the earth. But if it's Judea, do well in Judea. If it's Samaria, do well in Samaria, if it's the end of the earth. People get convoluted ideas about what evangelism is and what it isn't. None of us save, as you put it out, Christ saves. But the Great Commission is still alive. We're supposed to love, uh, 1A and 1B, and uh, we're supposed to make disciples. But 
E. Stanley Jones put it best, and I think I take that to heart. He says, we have inoculated the world with a mild form of Christianity, churchism. So it's practically useless against the real thing in dwelling. What, what was interesting is, is he had studied uh, the apologetics. And I said, here's what's really interesting. I mean, I know my walk. I know where I am. And I know I'm a, I'm a minuscule in, in all of it. I said, I don't even know what that is. Hmm. And he said, well, I started as, a, as an atheist. And he said, so I've studied it all the way from that through. And we actually ended up having an amazing conversation. But I like the way that you put it, one being emotional, one being logical. Yeah, and uh, I mean, head in the heart, uh, you know, we have, unfortunately, in the world we live in, we have become inductive reasoners. Like, uh, you know, Lecky writes about it in the history of European morals, this whole inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning, which is logic-oriented thought. But inductive reasoning simply is, if my heart likes it, I'm going to convince my mind that it's right, and then I'm going to ask you to legalize it. Whereas we were created to be deductive. That is, some things are right, some things are wrong. Some things are good, some things are bad. There is a moral law, and there's a moral lawgiver that C.S. Lewis talked about in Mere Christianity. So that's the apologetic side. I mean, we have to ask ourselves, are we inductive by nature? Are we deductive by nature? And then go from there. It's very easy to get to the Christ safe spot. But last year when I was studying apologetics at an event, someone made the statement, and it was John Lennox, I think, who's a Ph.D. in applied mathematics at Oxford, scientist who defends the gospel better than anybody I know. He said, the good news is only good news if people think their lives are bad. <laughs> what about the happy heathen? Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting point, isn't it? So what, what is it like to be around Robbie? Huh, man, you talk about, you, you, become, you feel, start feeling like an intellectual pygmy. As much as you <laughs> uh, credit your own prowess and your acumen, uh, I have never seen a person more committed to the gospel from a very young age more talented to share the gospel, but more humble to be receptive of those he shares it with. He operates in some very hostile settings from the academy down, but never have I seen this man without a smile to take on the detractors and to, be, uh, to have that humility, to have that depth of knowledge, to have that depth of vast understanding, and still be that committed to talking to everybody he ever shakes hands with is fascinating. A great model for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, when in 1999, when I wanted to find out what I wanted to do, Mr. Ziegler had started giving me tapes of Adrian Rogers. Remember, this is tapes era. So I said, you know what? I, that'll be a great model. As a communicator, I want to be able to articulate like Dr. Rogers, be short and pithy, and do it with an alliterative style and get some points out. To be able to entertain like Zig Ziegler and inform at the same time. I was already working for him, so that way but to be able to reach like Ravi Zacharias. So these are the three names I wrote on a napkin. By God's grace, I've had the privilege to interact with all three on a very personal level, uh, with Dr. Rogers, with his ministry, because he passed. But uh, the reason for that is it's, it's allowed me to understand that learning can be fun, teaching can be even more fun. Nowhere has, it sh has been said that learning has to be boring. So I think that's what you, we see when we go out and do these things, that people enjoy themselves. So when people ask me to describe myself, I said, I guess I'm what you would call an infotainer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That you are. A <laughs> fusion of information and entertainment. So. It, well, that brings up an interesting point. Uh, I, uh, we share something in common, which is somewhat unusual, in that we're both speakers mm -hmm. and we're both trainers. Right. They're two totally different things. <clears throat> which do you enjoy more? Uh, it's interesting because I... When I was training, I always wanted to be a speaker. When I became a speaker, everybody wanted me to spend more time and train. <laughs> so you probably have the same thing. Yeah. When, uh, so it's, uh, they want you to train when they can't afford you because you've become a speaker. And it's <laughs> yeah, backwards. Yeah. So, but this I will tell people who are out there who are aspiring for one or the other. It's always easier to learn how to speak. It is much harder to go back and train. Because you become a talking head and you love the sound of your own voice and you want yeah. to go A to Z, but in training you have to interact and you have to go. And so that's why even in my keynotes now, if it's a one-hour keynote, I will ask the host if I can do a 10-minute Q&A in between just so that the training routes stay and you have that connection with the audience. Yeah, I, I've been asked the same question. What's the difference between the two? And, and one of the descriptions I give is as a speaker, you're a, you're a rock star. Mm -hmm. uh, the immediate accolades, everybody's cheering, they're clapping, they're loving you. 
they forget you as soon as the next speaker comes up. <laughs> and, and in training, really imparting things that stand the potential to impact somebody's life for the rest of their life. Yeah, because you, you, uh, that's why that's why you have a show and I'm just a guest because you have the ability to <laughs> discern stuff. And when people ask me what's the difference between a trainer and a speaker, I say when two trainers get together, they complain about uh, the air conditioning in the room, the fact that they didn't have a flip chart, and that they really could not have been evaluated on lunch. <laughs> if two speakers get together, the conversation is, you're awesome, how am I? <laughs> so so, exactly. <laughs> Nailed. Done. We can we can wrap it right there. Pass the plate. Huh? That's the that's plate. Uh, so one of the things that I, that always impressed me when you were speaking is you used to say that political correctness will be the death of this country. Yeah, when you come here as a migrant and you get to watch the wonder of the world, John Wayne was my hero. And so, you know, people ask me, what's the most significant day in your life in America? And I said, when I went to Winterset, Iowa, and saw his birth, and I've seen much of the free world. So that's how America, that's what America meant to me. Uh, I remember when I was in Istanbul, Turkey one time, and someone was bashing America. I said, don't worry about bashing America. Most people who don't like her already live there. And so yeah. I come with a little bit of a, a jaded, I'm a founding father purist, I'm a constitutionalist, I'm a, cons you know. So when I look at political correctness as a terminology, all it is is saying, I am going to take a new definition for morality, and the best way to do that is to redefine everything in the dictionary that deals with morality. So everything has been brought down to its civil construct, and its original moral construct has been jettisoned. And that's what political correctness is. And that's the reason it'll be the death of this nation, because America is a Judeo-Christian nation found on bent knee. When Daniel Webster said, if we and our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the principles of eternal ethics, trifle on moral injunction, and recklessly destroy the political constitution that upholds us, no man can say how sudden the catastrophe that will overwhelm us and bury all our glory in profound obscurity. And all four have come to pass. Yeah, it's sad. It is. And so what he was talking about that, and when Jefferson said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, a good democracy will last about 200 years, it starts feeding on itself. Chesterton said, be careful of which fence you drop if you didn't ask yourself why it was up there in the first place. So when you put all these three things together anthropologically, and that's just a big word, but when you put it together culturally, what you begin to see is that you cannot redefine stuff for convenience. Right is right, good is good, and bad is bad. Um, and that's what I meant when I said political correctness will be the death of this nation. And I have seen it in my 30 years as to right being wrong and wrong being right, and everything is backwards. Uh, we were talking about, the, before we came on, this whole concept of microaggression. Right. Don't say anything for fear that someone may be offended. And language the, is, uh, I mean, if, if song is, is, is the communication medium of heaven, and, pro, and poetry was the communication medium of stories and sagas, then, then prose is the communication medium of mere mortals. And if you take that away, what do we have left? <laughs> right, for sure. Well, again, we were talking at, at this lunch I was at yesterday just about the value of, he asked me the question, he said, well, do you talk about God in your talks? Mm -hmm. And I said, I have gone to the point, for the most part, I start just like I start every show here with my pre-event mm -hmm. prayer. I start many of my talks the exact same mm -hmm. way. And he said, really, how does that go? I said, you know what? Amazingly well. It, it, it eliminates the question in the crowd's mind, do I believe? Absolutely. And um, I just think it's, I don't think we can be afraid of talking about what we believe. Well, um, I'll give you an illustration. Mr. Ziegler uh, got a negative piece of mail from a lady at an event when I was selling books and tapes. So she handed me the note saying she was upset that he was so vocal about his faith. And when we sat in the limo, he says, how many were there in the audience? I said, 300 plus. He said, and one person objected? I said, yeah. He says, Chris, throw that away. That's just bad marketing, dealing with her. And the reason people appreciate your honesty or appreciate your stand for something is because 99% of the people in any group do believe in something. They may not believe in your God, but they believe in something. Right. Pandering to the 1% is just bad marketing. So I would begin with a quantitative when I speak. I said, man is tri-dimensional, we're mental, physical, and spiritual, frustrated trying to eke out an existence in a two-dimensional way. 
in the Q&A, the first question is, what is the third dimension? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, Just throw a little chum in the yeah, water. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that's easy picking. So. Yeah, no, it, it um, and again, I think watching you, as I've evolved, it, your evolution in your walk mm -hmm. is ahead of mine. Uh, and, but in watching you and others, it's given me the strength to go out and do what I need to do yeah. to be the influencer on somebody else. Isn't that what we, I mean, basically why we do what we do? Absolutely. I mean, unless you're going to, and, uh, you know, you've been, you've been a trainer in a, and more successful in that realm in the training and sales than I have. Uh, I've just covered more miles probably geographically, so we, we have different claims to fame, I guess. But one thing I, I do know is that if we do not teach so that they would become teachers, or we, we don't follow Timothy's advice. Learn so that you can teach someone else. And if we can create that conduit, I think uh, we'll have fulfilled the Great Commission. Uh, love it. Um, man, how can we be out of time already? <laughs> this, this is crazy. So we got just uh, uh, maybe 30 seconds. What, one last great piece of wisdom. Um, I, I always like to leave people with uh, my favorite quote. That is, we planned with attitude, we prepared with aptitude. We participated with servitude and received with gratitude. That should be enough to separate us from the multitudes. Nice. That's one to remember. That's one that, that I remember when we were on the road together uh, and you would say that that was, I kept on going, man, I wish he talked slower. I wanted to write all that down. The good news now is it's actually across the uh, witnessatwork.com website. Um, Krish has got three great books. He's got more more things to uh, to share with you than we possibly have time in this show. No, here at Talking with Giants, our task is to bring you the best of the best. We work to do that every week. Thanks for joining us again. God bless. Have a fabulous week. Hi, Scott Schilling here. A number of years ago, I met Guinness Book of World Records holder, world's fastest reader, Howard Burr. His ability to manage knowledge impressed me. With the amount of information available today and the pace with which it's coming at us, having the ability to read and remember that information is more critical every day. Howard told me that using his techniques, I could double my reading speed in just a few short hours. Initially, I wasn't sure, but if in fact Howard was right, it'd be the best $100 in a couple hours I ever spent. Then Howard made an irresistible offer. Learn it first. Double your reading speed in just a few hours, or you owe me nothing. Now, how can you go wrong? The results have been amazing. I asked Howard if he would pass along that same opportunity to our TWG audience. Emphatically, Howard said yes. To learn more, simply go to TWGSpeedReading.com. Watch a short introductory video, sign up for the webinar that best fits your schedule, and double your reading speed in just a few hours, or you pay nothing. Now, that's a deal worth looking into twgspeedreading.com